Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between. I'm John Maysale, bringing another review of The Expanse. Not a live reaction like last time. Last time, that was just a little experiment to see how I felt doing it, see how you guys felt uh, with me doing that. And I think we can all agree that me doing reviews feels better than me doing live reactions. So I'm glad for those comments that you guys gave me so I can go back to doing the style that I enjoy. I did see the comments too about the posters that I was using before for The Expanse. It really was no preference of mine. I just looked up posters of The Expanse and happened to chose this one. So I have different ones now that I'm using for The Expanse. Now this episode had a lot uh, of information they kind of threw throw at you. I'm, I'm, I had to watch it like several times. Uh, going through my information that I that I gathered from it. So I'm going to try to keep it short, but no guarantees that's going to be short because there really was a lot of information they gave you. So let's get into the review now. Switch into it. Here we are. See, doesn't this, this looks a lot better, don't you think? Yes. All right. So we start the episode at the med tech. Uh, the girl, which I don't remember her name, um, and I didn't go back and look, so you guys can tell me what her name is. Uh, th so the girl, she's with Havelock. Miller thinks the girl is Havelock's prostitute, right? But we as the viewer thought so too. Before seeing the language lessons Havelock was taking. Uh, so I can't blame Miller for thinking that. Once Miller learns that, he says the same thing I had said before about Havelock. It's, it's about how you act, not the language that you're speaking. So I, I agree with him in, in his take about that. Um, and Miller blames her for what happened to Havelock, claiming someone paid him, pay, paid her to lure him down. Um, I don't get the feeling that that is what happened, but it's, it's not out of the realm of possibilities, especially with the way things have been on series. So I think Miller is right to be suspicious, even if it turns out to be unfounded. All right, so now we go to the Tachi. Uh, Holden finally wakes up. They patch up Burton's leg with a nice fancy cast. I liked how it just kind of sealed itself around that nice f future technology, right? So Alex tells them no one should know they're there. They're basically just a, a metallic tumbleweed floating around. But someone sent them a message for some reason, which was mysterious. But they do that. Uh, whoever messaged them, I think they either know a lot about Martian transponders or knew that the Tashi itself escaped the Doniger. Uh, either way, this person knows a lot. Uh, so from there, now we're taken back in time, 11 years ago, on the Anderson Station, which is identified as an ore refinery in the belt. Uh, we saw a man playing a matching game with a little girl. We're assuming this is a father and his daughter. Uh, the man goes to a comm station and receives a message. It the message sounded like it said, Anderson Station, this is UN1, are you ready to surrender? And then the scene cuts out. Uh, no idea who it was, but if it's UN1, I wonder if that means it was an Earth ship. Because uh, Earth is controlled by the UN at this point. Uh, so we don't really know any more information from that. Um, now the scene cuts out. Uh, we're back in the Tachi. Then a man we've seen previously uh, in episode four, that's Fred Johnson on the Tycho station. Um, that's the one who actually sent them uh, the message. Uh, he requests them to contact him if they don't want to start a war. Okay. Um, of all the arguments, Holden's made actually made the most sense. Uh, being the only survivors from the Canterbury and the Doniger, who's going to believe their story at this point? Um, but it's a, it's a split vote. Uh, on where to go, so they're just gonna f float around in space some more for a while, all right. Um, and watching this, I was saying, you know, come to think of it, Fred Johnson sounded an awful lot like the guy who messaged Anderson Station before. So that was kind of in the back of my mind during that scene, as soon as it started. Um, now, we're going back to series. We're on a transport, and it's, it, and you can hear some people talking to each other. Uh, they think that the ship that attacked the Doniger was an OPA ship. And I, 
As I said before though, I think the tech is too advanced for belters to be able to build on their own. It's not that they can't build it, I just don't think they have the resources or experience necessary to build it. They do have nice technology as it is, but it's primarily like mining technology that we've seen so far. And we haven't seen anything to show them capable of building weapons like that or ships like that. Um, so I don't think it's strictly OPA. Uh, right after that, the power goes off on the transport. Miller hears what sounds like someone threatening him behind him, but it was it was nothing. So is he hearing things? Is he drugged? Is there some sort of like secret transmission? Maybe someone planted on him to mess with his head. I'm not sure, but that was a that was a very interesting scene um, in terms of Miller hearing those things. So after we we see the police department scene, I'm gonna skip that part. Um, we're going to uh, Julie's apartment now with Miller. He's looking for the Anibus. Uh, Octavia comes to check on him to see when he's going to look for Kavari, who's the one that had impaled uh, <laughs> Havelock. Uh, turns out Miller has seen the footage. Uh, Octavia sees that he's still looking for Julie and she thinks it's because he, he's doing it for the money. Um, unless Miller is historically good at hiding his intentions, I don't know why she would get the idea from that idea from his demeanor. Um, Miller then tells her that the Anubis uh, plan, which was on the memory crypt, is connected to the Scopuli plan in terms of their uh, flight plans. Um, if you put the Scopuli and Anubis plan on an intercept course, the Scopuli goes right in the path of where the Canterbury and Doniger were destroyed. Uh, so he thinks there's a connection in that area. Uh, Octavia thinks he needs to bring it to higher ups, but Miller doesn't seem ready to do that yet. Um, okay, so I can't blame him for that because he doesn't know all the parties that are involved yet with how many people have been killed so far. We've had the Canterbury destroyed. Uh, we've had the the Scopuli ransacked, the Doniger destroyed. There's no way to tell who's on, on whose side and the stakes seem to be very high. So we're going to skip now a couple of scenes um, back on series. Miller looks o over the, the scuffle Julie had with the guy in the docking bay that we saw before. Um, and it looks like the man knew her because he kind of gives her like a little pointing uh, uh, there camera <laughs> kind of gives her like, like a little pointing sign there like that. Um, so he checks the ID of the guy and it comes up as the name Neville Bosch. Uh, Dawes shows up again. Um, he and Miller get to talking. Kavari is in an OPA safe house, but not necessarily under OPA protection, right? Uh, Dawes tells Miller then that the OPA controls most of the functions on series, and we kind of got the idea with all the different OPA tattoos and, and people talking about OPA as he as Miller was going to different parts of series. Uh, so we kind of got that idea in a way. Um, seems and during this conversation, seems Belters and Martians have the same view of Earthers of Earthers taking for granted what they have on Earth. Uh, the Belters want to make series their homeworld. Um, well. I'm assuming Belters could be OPA, but it sounds more like Belters want their own place to call home. And it seems they want to make series their home world like Earthers have Earth and Martians have Mars, which makes sense to me, right? Um, kind of a gathering point for them. Uh, Dawes gives Miller a contact card that will show him the location of Kavari. In exchange, Dawes wants information on what happened to Julie. Um, then we get a confirmation during the scene too that Julie was in fact OPA. Uh, which we kind of got that suspicion to. Uh, so that's not too much of a surprise in this scene. Um, skipping a couple of scenes here to stay with Miller. He does find Neville. They, they do their little fight for a bit. Uh, then he questions him about Julie. We get a little background about Julie, like when she went to the mines of Callisto after the mines had collapsed. And because of that, she has to take lifelong cancer meds because of the the fumes that she was breathing in from the mines so maybe julie wasn't all that bad and and crazy like we originally were led to believe maybe she just wanted to help belters but her father may have been prejudiced and didn't want her to help them saying why would you care about them that kind of thing so her story is starting to make a little more sense with that uh information so now let's go back to uh, to Anderson. 
All right, back in time again. Um, in the final Anderson scene, there's uh, at this point, they're still trying to surrender, but UN command isn't listening. Uh, they do figure out a way to send a message out past the past the jammers. It turns out that they're protesting because the children are sick because of the low oxygen environment. They have a particular cancer as a result. Uh, during the transmission, though, while they're sending out, the station gets hit and blasted by something. And all the people that were in there get blown into space. And it turns out Fred Johnson was the one responsible. Um, I don't know why they blew out Anderson Station. Yes, they were trying to surrender, but it would make sense that they're trying to hide the effects of low oxygen because they want people to mine in space, right? Um, but I'm thinking they must have heard the signal that went out past the jammers and just ignored it. You couldn't... There's no way they didn't hear that message. There's no way. Um, so because of that, uh, and, and therefore, uh, Belters must have heard it to other Belters. Um, so it's no wonder... Belters have animosity towards Earthers uh, the way they do. So the Belters doing what they did to Havelock, knowing that he's an Earther, um, makes sense. Um, well, their feeling makes sense. The action, not so much, but the feeling makes sense. Um, so now we're we're going back to Tachi. Okay, um, They're receiving instruction again from Fred Johnson. He tells them they won't be harmed. Just like the people on Anderson weren't harmed, right? Um... <laughs> And to change their transponder code so that they're not detected, right? So they change the name of the Tachi to the Rosinante after they do the transponder code changes. Um, it's too bad they didn't go with Alex's um, suggestion of screaming firehawks. That has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now um, we're from there, we're going back to Miller. Um, he checks out the place of the Sherpa. That we got during the match during the episode, but he doesn't find anything. He does glance though at a like this weird robotic rat. Um, this made me think of the different rats and birds that we had seen around series. So I was wondering, are those actually real birds and rats, or all those robotic ones that are kind of running around, right? Like, are they do they have like OPA chips in them, and they're just um, getting surveillance around the station, right? Um, so that's what that I, I thought about that. Um, and before this part, though, uh, Miller throws out a communicator into a recycler. I don't know. Maybe you guys can tell me. Uh, was that the comm that showed Kavari's location? Uh, why would he throw that out? Too high of a price, maybe. Um, I mean, Havelock is alive, right? And he doesn't seem enthusiastic at all about working with the OPA, OPA, but it was still strange that he would just throw it out. Um, so now he goes back to Julie's apartment and takes a chip out of the robotic hamster that was in her apartment. He walks out, gets shocked and kidnapped by a couple of people. And that shocking kidnapping stage happens while there's crowds of people walking around. Uh, and I'm like, did they not notice? Well, I didn't care, right? Um, and the episode just ends there. All right, so hopefully this is, it doesn't look like this video came out to be too long. Um, so this this was a, a lot of information this episode. I felt like there were some um, kind of like small filler parts in the, be in, in, uh, the beginning of the episode with, with uh, Anderson. So I felt like I could kind of cut those scenes out of my review. Um, but I watched it obviously, like watched the episode like two or three times um, and it was great didn't have too many complaints um obviously in this review there were a couple things that didn't make 100 percent sense um but yeah very good episode um hopefully you guys are getting something out of this too like if a lot of you guys had seen the expanse already and judging by how the show is you can watch episodes two or three times and still miss things so hey maybe you're getting something out of this that you had missed before right um and that's why we go back and watch these things especially for a show like the expanse that has so much that goes into it uh, so that's it for this review of Season 1, Episode 5, Back to the Butcher. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time. Hey everyone, did you enjoy today's video? Be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Did you hate today's video? Then be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. It's really the only way I can tell. Thanks.